Hello and welcome. This is the marketplace. Here we talk about trends, we analyze the market and see find out how global development impact business activities in Ghana. On the program today, public policy think tank criticizes Bank of Ghana's zero funding policy for government project as part of IMF bailout conditions. We'll be looking at this in detail here on the marketplace. And also the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers of Ghana predict first pricing window in July will see four prices go down by 3%. All these and more, you get them here on the marketplace between now and 1.30. You can keep your comments and be interactive with us on Twitter. Our handle is JoyBusinessGH and on Facebook, JoyBusiness. For more, you can log on to myjoyonline.com slash business. My name is John Kojo Amwako. Marketplace returns shortly after the break. You're welcome back. And in our first story, the head of research at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Dr. John Kwache, has been speaking about the decision by government to stop the Bank of Ghana to extend funding to government. This is part of conditions set under the IMF program. In an interview, Dr. Kwache said the approach should have been gradual. For most of these individuals and institutions, they are moving their investments from pound and euro. The Bank of Ghana is permitted to provide some financing to government. You know, if you look at the act, it says that the bank, together with the rest of the public, can provide only up to 10% of the uh, uh, government revenue. Okay, that's what the current act says. Now we are going from there to total elimination of Bank of Ghana's financing. What I'm, the point I'm making is that, well, um, we are in a developing country where the government debt market is not sufficiently developed. Okay, so in that situation, you, you, it's only logical that the central bank is ready to provide some kind of financial accommodation to government. This is a developing country. Now, if you go to, you know, the Federal Reserve, they may not be lending directly to government. If you go to the Bank of England, they may not be lending directly to government. But I know that. The Bank of England participates in the secondary market for government treasury bills. Do you get me? In other words, they will not buy government uh, bills directly when it's issued. But if somebody is holding government bills in the market and they want to redeem it, you know, the Bank of Ghana can go in and, and buy. So in that sense, I think that indirectly they are, even, they are also lending to government. I can understand why you know, they are eliminating this financing. And those of us who are even members of the Monetary Policy Committee, we should even be happier. Do you get me? Because, because in the past, we have always said that, you know, excessive uh, lending to government from the central bank has been part of, you know, the, the, I mean, the, the problems that frustrate our, the conduct of monetary policy. So we, I'm saying that it's a, it's a good thing. All that I'm saying is that the abrupt ending you know of the of the of the lending um, can create problems for government and it means that government will have to go to the market all the time it can even crowd out the private sector you see um, it can crowd out the private sector because previously government was getting some of the financing from bank of ghana now they have to you know do it entirely from the from the you know, the public sector outside Bank of Ghana. And the UK's decision to exit from the European Union might be coming with some good news for Ghana. Checks by Joy Business indicate that the prices of all Ghana's euro bonds have gone up, while the interest are also declining. George Raffi has more in this report. For most of these individuals and institutions, they are moving their investments from pound and euro to save assets like gold, US dollar, and the Japanese yen. This has resulted in the value of the British pound recording its worst depreciation in a long while. For most of these investors, the uncertainty surrounding the UK's exit from the European Union means that they have to move their assets to safe places. And that is why the country's euro bonds are currently benefiting from this action. Checks on Bloomberg Investment Portal shows that interest on Ghana's 2017 bond, for instance, has dropped 
from 7.9% on June 24 to 7.4% on June 29, while the interest on the 2023 bond has dropped from 11.13% to 10 Point seven two per cent, and the 2030 bond has dropped from 10.30 per cent to 10.11 per cent. The development could also reduce the cost of servicing these debts, which will go a long way to reduce the about 10 billion Ghana cities that government has set aside to service these debts. Some analysts have also argued that if the uncertainty surrounding UK's exit from the European Union goes on then it is likely that government could secure some favorable rates on its planned eurobond issue which could result in reducing the cost of servicing this fourth bond and the ceo of the national petroleum authority has expressed concern about the various pricing regimes adopted by oil marketing companies countrywide he said this defeats the purpose of the deregulation of the petroleum downstream regime Parliament decided to amend the Act of uh, NPA, and in that amendment, it does mention multiple pricing. First, it used to be singular uniform pricing, but now it is called multiple pricing. So that by itself is the law that is now giving the power to the deregulation. We are seeing price competition, and uh, most of the OMCs are rather trying to lower their prices in the countryside more than their principal uh, operators. And what we mean is that we have said that the price of every OMC should be uniform across the country. So if the price of petrol is three cities per liter, then goil in Accra should be three cities per liter and goil in Paga should be three cities per liter. So if you have shell at three cities, 50 pesos per liter, then shell in Accra should be three cities, 50 pesos per liter, and then shell in Paga should be three cities, 50 pesos per liter. Now the problem that we are rather now having is that where the other OMC is of lower prices. The dealer for that OMC rather now wants to sell at a lower price. And that is where we have the challenge as to whether should we allow dealers for OMCs to charge the competitive price they think they should sell at to be competitive and to sell more volumes. So that is a challenge of the deregulation. But in terms of taking advantage of the consumer, that is not there. Rather, the consumer is going to benefit. Meanwhile, the Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers of Ghana, Duncan Amwa, has given the indication that pricing, the pricing window for next month may, may come down slightly by almost about 3%. And we do have him on phone to actually give perspective on this and also to discuss exactly what Moses Saga just indicated earlier. Um, you're welcome, sir. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon to your cherished listeners. Good. Um, the regulator is saying it is worrisome, the situation where you see OMC setting prices differently from one jurisdiction to the other. Let's say petrol prices in somewhere around Asimfos would be different from petrol prices in Accra by, the same, by a particular OMC. He says that is a defeatist approach towards the deregulation environment. What do you make of that? And have you ever come across situations like that? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, we share in that concern by the regulator. And uh, we have also raised the uh, same issue uh, severally and variously on different platforms. One, uh, if you enter a deregulated market and uh, you are not able to manage a certain minimal, you know, uh, conventional uh, standard, uh, chances are that you will throw the whole program out of uh, sync with what you actually set out to do and what is actually being done. Uh, if you allow OMC uh, to charge uh, differently uh, from one region or from one part of town to the other, 
Uh, it has its own negative repercussions and challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, it is not only a disincentive to places where infrastructure by way of petroleum uh, investment hasn't gone uh, very well with. You talk of uh, places in Ghana where you would not have big storage tanks. You would not have uh, bigger VDCs or OMTs uh, playing at so the cost of transporting products to them invariably uh, goes a bit higher. But when uh, these people decide to charge a bit higher as compared to what happens or prevails in the city, uh, you would only be encouraging uh, some geopolitical uh, disadvantage and where people would now be forced to migrate. Uh, from one part of hell to the other because... Uh, but, well, Mr. 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 Moore, should it all not be part of this deregulatory environment where prices are liberalized, such that the company involved or the company in perspective would decide what to do at what point in time just around the country? They know how much it costs them to actually send, let's say, petrol from here to the northern region. And I said, if they decide to cut down prices in the northern region, once it, I mean, it, it, once it does not affect their bottom line, I'm sure, as a corporate entity, they can advise us accordingly. Why should the Consumers Association be worried? Why should the regulator be worried? It, it would sound uh, pretty economical, and it would sound uh, mathematical, but it also is defeated, like I indicated. Hmm. Uh, the repercussions are a bit enormous, and we may not be in for that kind of regime. If you think the United States, yes, uh, most of the states uh, will quote different prices at different times, you know, but they have a different economic environment where people are able to afford or cushion themselves uh, in the face of uh, poor being lower here, being higher here. But in Ghana, what you find is the direct opposite. Mm. Most of the parts where poor products uh, will be sold for much if we allow the system to set up will be the rural areas because infrastructure there uh, has not been developed as much. So you may drive sometimes 10 kilometers and find only one filling station. Mm. Now, if that filling station is allowed to charge arbitrary prices, what it means is that the people over there whose economic uh, circumstances are already uh, low and challenging uh, will now be forced to cough up a little more to be able to just go about their normal duties. And for a country like Ghana, that system would not survive and it would not help. Like I indicated, it would also force most of the people in the rural communities where poor products are being sold uh, for much more as we see today, uh, to now want to move or migrate uh, down south. Because as you come to places like Tema and Accra, where you find bigger hands from VDCs, uh, bigger OMCs also playing, if you drive every two, three kilometers, you'll find one service station here and there. Price will be much lower because it is quite easier transporting products uh, from uh, some of these bigger towns uh, to the filling station. I okay. suppose someone buying products in WA and being asked to pay maybe twice or one and a half times what the person that Accra is paying. Economically, it is not uh, okay. viable. And then I think that, 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 is, that is clear, but the, the, the point is, uh, are you then recommending the situation where uh, Ghana regulates in an unregulated market, for example, and if you can also tie in the issue where you think, you're, you're saying that the price window may see some downward adjustment by almost about 3% for me? Yes, uh, indeed, like uh, we have indicated, uh, under the regulation, it does not necessarily mean there's no regulation at all. There still is a regulator in place. And one of the rules the regulator has, which must be respected by all players across board, is that prices, there should be cross pricing across board. So gold in Accra are not sold differently from gold in Tapa or gold in uh, Tamale. Mm. Gold should be able to have a uniform pricing because in the price build-up, let me get back to it. In the price build-up... Uh, we don't, we don't have much. I think we'll come back to that. So we get yeah. the details from maybe in a separate interview. But then, why are you saying prices, I mean, Ghana may see some price reduction by almost about 3%? Can and it's likely prices uh, would have to go down from uh, the consumer's uh, perspective. We believe over the past two weeks, uh, since the last pricing window kicked in that saw prices being maintained, uh, the world market index at the time was trading around 50. Uh, if you have been watching the world market 
uh, WCI indexes and as, as well as Brent, you would realize that for most of the two weeks uh, that we have seen, because of the Brexit or the EU uh, UK standard, yeah. prices uh, actually declined to around 46, 47 for most part of the period. So it should reflect accordingly. But that, that, that was just between sorry that was just between last uh, the fr friday and uh, monday and i do um, know that the window must have about must have about two weeks to actually yes. contain but these adjustments even, it's, it's not yet two the, weeks even before the even before the the uk vote uh, the world market kept fluctuating and mostly it was moving around uh 748 dollars up down from the 50 dollar mark that uh, this current pricing window was ushered in with. So clearly, if anybody would want to be fair to the Guardian consumer, uh, naturally some uh, cuts would have to be seen at the top. And by the way of indicators, we are also monitoring by tomorrow we'll be able to put out a full list of OMCs that have complied with uh, um, our request. And the uh, Guardian will be able to determine where and which of the places uh, to buy uh, cheaper products from. But we believe strongly that uh, some reductions will come about in the next couple of hours. Okay, we thank you very much, Mr. Duncan Amorza, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Petroleum Consumers Association. And back here on the marketplace, unemployment is a pressing challenge here in Ghana. But there is one young man who is doing something different. At age 24, John Ama owns Oreos Group which has three subsidiaries. He was just recently named among Forbes' list of 30 outstanding entrepreneurs under the age of 30. His passion is helping young people create jobs. How does he do that? The Joy Business Van heads to his office at North Carnegie here in Accra. Hello everyone, welcome to our show this week. We are at Oreos Group, founded by John Ama, who was recently named amongst the 30 most promising entrepreneurs in Africa. So you're welcome to Oreos Group. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are some of our staff. This is Elvis. Elvis, how are you? Say hi to Joy Business. Hi. <laughs> and that's Malakaya, our skating, our caretaker. He's sorting out a few things. Eugenia is also with us as well. Okay, so now you can come over to my office and see where her we do the magic. Young, dynamic, resourceful, and visionary, John Ama is in the business of helping young people create jobs. As we speak, there are over 200 million young people who are unemployed. And in about 2030 to 2060, we're going to have over 600 million people unemployed. Currently, there are over 11 million entrants into the labor market each year in Africa. If you look at the global statistic, you have over 50% of Africa's population being youth. The challenges for unemployment are very clear. So for me, my passion is how can I help reduce unemployment? So my ultimate goal is where are the jobs in Ghana, in Africa, and how do we get young people the jobs in Africa? Does it mean they're starting their own or being skilled to start their own? John himself owns three firms which fall under Aureus Group, that is Business Advisory Firm, the Ghana Center of Entrepreneurship, Employment and Innovation, Trade Invest, an agribusiness advisory and farm management firm, as well as Aureus Capital, patient capital investment firm. His entrepreneurship drive started while he was a teen when he decided to set up a job recruitment agency for young people his age. But initially I asked myself if I was on the right path, if this was going to make sense. And at every point where I didn't have enough money to continue or that I had people who said stuff and thought that, oh, this guy won't make it, you know, or you actually reached out to people and said, oh, they will help and didn't help. I thought, well, this is this way. But as time went by, each year I saw progress. I saw growth in the number of people who would simply come and say, John, I was at this event of yours. And that's where I got the inspiration to take my business to the next level. We've worked with a lot of people and I've had the, the stories are my breakthrough. <laughs> and I want to see a world where young people see themselves as having the best potential ever, especially in Africa. And they can be whatever they can be without having to know that age is, an, is a limit to their impact. That's all I want to say. That's my breakthrough. John is not keeping the passion for entrepreneurship to himself. He mentors other young people to aspire to get to where he is. He's a sought-after public speaker and his hard work has chalked him several accolades. 
The recent being listed as part of the 2016 class of Forbes prestigious 30 under 30. Forbes 30 under 30. I mean, uh, it validates the fact that we have a good business model and that we have a, a business that would continue to grow into the future to affect a lot, a lot more lives. But it validates the fact that it's been worth this journey. And for me, if for nothing at all, that's just it for me. That it tells me, oh, John, there's hope. John, he's just warming up into a great future. So at age 24, you have accomplished so much. Is there anything you can do? With God, all things are possible. <laughs> so, so yes, I mean, we're looking forward to do more. Uh, we're growing as a firm. We want to support a lot of Ghanaian startups, uh, build their capacity, but also provide funding for them. I think there's a lot of uh, innovation within the space, and we need more Ghanaian middle class, upper class, whatever class to say that, hey, uh, we can show them that value, and they're ready to, to invest in them. So that's the position for us in the next uh, phase of our business. All right, so great conversation with John. Um, I remember the show is brought to you by Busy, making good things happen and empowered by Joy Business. Now, time to look at how your investments are faring on the Ghana stock, how the currency is also doing here in Ghana, and we'll be looking at the commodity market, how it's also faring after Brexit. Some recoveries and rallying being done there across board and in Ghana here total volume of 124,922 was uh, discovered yesterday at a total value of 94,988 that brought market capitalization to about 54 billion 788.65 million Ghana cities so in that particular respect the composite index which measures the total performance of the Ghana stock exchange actually saw some marginal decline to about 10.42 as against the financial index, which also saw some decline between 13.41 um, to 13.44 there per annum. So that's how come um, the market is behaving the way it's doing. So for those of you investing in the Ghana stock exchange, you are marginally losing some value. But yesterday saw only one equity moving the market in the equity of EGL, that's Enterprise Group Ghana Limited, which recorded a decline of two pesos per share and opened this morning at two Ghana cities, 42 pesos per share. You can actually check that out there on the Ghana stock. And Nigeria has also seen some kind of a recovery there, even though it's not that much, as Nestle Total, Gassem, Guinness, and MBR recorded some appreciation on their values in Nigeria. And May Baker, Unity Bank, Wemma Bank, Access, Sky Bank also did lose some money, one, one, two, two, and four Kobos respectively to their investors' capital. Now, let's move on to the commodity market where crude oil is currently trading at $49.77 after regaining almost about 83 cents per barrel. Gold, after gaining $2.42 per ounce, is currently trading around $1,318.28 quite an impressive performance there. The rally has been quite strong after Brexit. The gold making all the incursions to their investors. And cocoa also gaining $25 per ton and currently trading around $3,009 per ton there. Now let's look at how the Ghana city is faring against the top five major trading currencies. Against the US dollar, the city depreciated, lost against the British pound, lost against the euro, lost against the Chinese one, but gained against the CFA France. So for one dollar, you need three Ghana cities, 92 per square. For one British, for one British pound, you need five Ghana cities, 21. For one euro, four Ghana cities, 33. And 58 per square will get you one Chinese yuan. For those of you who are interested in monitoring the Chinese economy and trading with them. But 151.48 um, CFA franc will get you one Ghana city. That's exactly how the market, the, 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 the currency market is faring and the um, the commodity market is also doing so that's exactly how it is and that's how your investments are faring so this is where we draw down the curtains on the market and how we draw down the curtains again on the marketplace here my name is john kojo and walker but you can still stay interactive our twitter handle is joy business gs and on facebook is joy business for more you can log on to myjoyonline.com business have a very wonderful afternoon